What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the second episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. In the second episode, I continue my discussion with Mohammed and Julia about their life as researchers in Germany and how they adapted to the competitive research environment as well as the country and the city where they are currently working at. We also discuss more about their careers, their plans for their future, and many such interesting things which is relevant for most doctoral researchers in these phases of our lives. So stay tuned till the very end, and I hope to see you back for every episode which we'll be publishing more or less every week. Second episode. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. We are forward. happy to be back. Yeah. We're all from different countries and we're all doing research in Germany. What would you say was the one of the biggest difficulties or challenges you faced settling into Germany or in the, in the city, for example, but Nauheim, which is not a big city? So, what are the biggest challenges you faced and how did you overcome these? Um, I can start. Um, so I come from Egypt, uh, which is a sunny land, and um, the biggest <laughs> challenge when I moved to Germany was, was the cold, we- not the cold winters, the dark winters. So cold you can, I mean, I think in the first year in Germany, some German person told me that there's no bad weather, there is bad clothing, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I agree to, because if it's cold, you, you can just like put on proper clothing and feel warm. Uh, but the darkness, I mean, uh, for me, uh, in Egypt, even in winter, it's always, the sun is always there. And, but over here, I started in Göttingen before moving to Bad Nauheim. It was always very cloudy. And uh, this always brought me, they call it like the winter blues. And um, yeah, by time, uh, I started to like learn how to adapt to it, either by taking like vitamin pills or even getting one of these lamps. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really know how they are properly called, but one of these lamps which emit this kind of wavelength of uh, UV Solar. The, yeah, yeah. that you require uh, and which helped. So uh, this was the main challenge. And of course, um, I come from a completely different culture, um, which was another different or tough thing to adapt to. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say I had like sort of a culture shock, but uh, it was a big change of a culture. It's not like, for example, you're um, from a West, another Western country and you're moving to Germany. Um, and... Um, for me, like what what helped me adapt to it is, or what helped me overcome this culture change or shock, if you if you wish, is um, is like the will to adapt and the will to also get to be know and get introduced to this other culture, and blend into it, um, and, and like make friends from there, and also like try what they do and like do what they do, um, with of course keeping some of my uh, values. Um, but of course, this helped me settle uh, in Germany better. But if you want to speak about Bad Nauheim, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a different story because it's a very small town. Um, I have to be honest that uh, I didn't really enjoy living here. <laughs> but uh, I had a lot of uh, activities in Frankfurt. Uh, um, as I said, like I was doing sports and so on. So I always like used to go out of the town. And of course, the good side about being in Bad Nauheim is that in the lab, since many of us don't have a lot of circles outside of the lab we saw we became more more as a family you know so for me this was an advantage that you go to the lab every day and it's it's a nice thing because you're gonna meet your i mean we we, were, we actually call each other in the lab brother and sister so uh, <laughs> uh, brother a lot yeah yeah sister not so sometimes, much, but sometimes yeah. Yeah. it's okay the concept <laughs> is there anyway yeah the concept exists yeah. that's true that's true yeah so uh so yeah, so that's a positive side. So in total, I would say my experience here was uh, very enjoyable and I, uh, I enjoyed my PhD period. Yeah. So coming back to Bad Nauheim, <laughs> I think that was one of the most difficult uh, part to accept for me. And actually was when I made a pros and cons list before coming here. <laughs> I'm an organized uh, person, mm-hmm. I overthink. 
So you, you made a literal list with all the yeah, positives and negatives? Yeah, I, I did. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, but it doesn't help. <laughs> If I can share a secret, <laughs> absolutely no help. <laughs> Because at the end, the cons list was much longer than the pros, and I'm still here. So it depends. So you have okay. to I mean, make... you should wait, it. Exactly. wait the pros and the cons, I not think... the number. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Bad Nauheim was definitely at the top of my cons list. And uh, it stayed there <laughs> up to now. But But as, so I'm, I come from a big city and uh, I used to have a very active life in terms of going out. I really enjoy going to restaurants, uh, bars, uh, uh, movies and theaters and so on. Mm -hmm. We are lucky that we have Frankfurt close by, but it's not... Well, at the beginning I thought I would go more often, but mm -hmm. I realized that it's not it's so not much so. the case. Although it's my fault. So m mine and uh, of many other people in the lab, but I could go more if I wanted to. So I, I shouldn't complain too much about <laughs> it. But yes, living in a small city changed a lot because I don't know. The good thing is that here, uh, like people in the restaurants close to my house say hi to me when they see me. In Milano, they don't even know me because it's too big. <laughs> <laughs> and but so except from that, I think the biggest challenge at the beginning was living far from my family because I'm very attached to them. So living alone now, I enjoy it a lot, but in the first two months was tough. But as Mohammed said, uh, having people in the lab, really, here I found my second family and um, I found people I would never think I would find. Although we are very different from different backgrounds, different uh, countries and different ideas, I think that finding coming to lab and seeing people that are not just colleagues but friends made the whole uh, experience very different because uh, I know many people who had to move out from the country and go to another country and they found themselves in labs like in big cities for example where mm -hmm. all the locals had already their own circles of friends and so it was much tougher to to integrate and to adapt to a different life. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it's very two two sort of very different approaches there, but somehow we adapted and we're still here. Right? So. Yes, we are, <laughs> and we enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Okay, so moving along, is there a particular activity that you sort of really enjoy doing, which you which helps you relax? Need not be something you need to do daily, or is there an activity which you do a lot to relax? and helps you sort of get through a day or get through the week, get through certain times. So is there something like that which you would like to? Yeah, for me, I, um, um, I do karate since I was five, uh, 27 now. Um, so uh, It's 22 years of karate. Yeah. <laughs> something. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I still keep it. Uh, and I still keep it in a, like, not just in a, um, practicing but also like competing so um and and um, this was one of the main things that helped me um, um like relax if you, if you wish uh, so the idea that because i mean since i was also competing in it so i always had on my mind as well that i have to um uh that it's not only the science which is in my head but this other competition that's coming or this other blah 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 Uh, or this other training uh, so um, so yeah for me doing karate was one of the uh, things that helped me relax other than that I mean uh, one of the other things that sometimes helped me relax is just sit down at home with a cup of tea or something and watch a movie Netflix uh, or yeah, <laughs> Netflix these days as well. yeah. Um, but yeah but it was mainly doing sports um, I guess everyone has a different thing uh, Yeah. What you do. yeah, I don't think sport was my main <laughs> thing that helped me to relax. Although recently I forced, well, before they closed the gym, <laughs> I swear I went for <laughs> six months straight. <laughs> Now I don't, I don't have proofs, but <laughs> no, I, I force myself to do sports because I, I also think it really helps you get through like also bad days because uh, I also realize when when I do like one hour of sport after that, I'm much more relaxed less stressed and less tense just for like chemical things that are going on in the body also so I think that that is very important but I think that the thing that made me more relaxed is cooking I, I love well I love eating also but I love cooking 
and uh, I really I like taking care of myself uh, from that side. This is something I think I learned from my mom. Not the cooking; she's not very good. <laughs> I hope she doesn't oh, hope listen. She doesn't. <laughs> she we'll doesn't. make sure to send it to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, she's not great as many other Italian moms, but uh, she's great in many other things. For example, she always taught me to like take care of myself in a way that, for example, I still uh, like um, every time I eat, I put like the proper uh, things on the table, the tablecloth, and everything. So okay. like. Uh, when you are keeping a family. system yeah. yeah you're keeping a system and uh, for example she would never spend like a saturday all uh, in pajamas she would always <laughs> keep her routine even if she's sick even if she's at home she would always make sure that everything goes as Can it should that's typical melanese Yes, I think it is. <laughs> but it helps, I have to say. I didn't understand at the beginning, but this uh, kind of level of like self-care keeps you alive somehow. Okay, Because yeah. if you, especially when you feel bad, both physically and mentally, like staying and, uh, I don't know, not really like changing, putting on new clothes and like going out and forcing yourself to do things, It just gets worse then. Yeah, I realize yeah. uh, over time that it's... Although I love watching movies and there are days where I do nothing else and there are mm -hmm. evenings when just like ice cream and the movie can Ooh, really heal yes, uh, a bad day. There are other, other moments when you need to force yourself and go out. If friends ask me to go out, I'm someone who never said no, even when I really didn't feel like going out. But then you realize that you go out and you feel better. And I think it helps. So I would say cooking and taking care of myself and also planning the time to travel. I'm a big fan of traveling. I think like seeing new cultures and new places, it's, it's one of the best thing and the thing I love the most. So making sure that to keep some of my like days off mm -hmm. to, to travel and go out from here. Yeah, kept me and gave me something also to look forward to. And that's important because when you are in a very stressful time, At least for me, I need like a, something else that comes afterwards that I'm, I go to bed in the evening and I think, okay, one month and then I'm whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's a very difficult time because I don't know when I can travel exactly. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, let's not. I mean, I kind of feel the entire world is experiencing a bad knowing phenomenon yeah so, we are actually <laughs> not yeah we are lucky we are lucky so, because to an extent <laughs> we were used to it before yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so i have a question here to both of you in the sense that if so let's say in the beginning if this sort of scientific approach to life or it sort of scientific career didn't work out in the beginning, what would you have done otherwise? Not, not what you're going to do after, but like what would you have done if, let's say, uh, like somehow the, the science didn't speak to you? What would you have done? An alternative career I would yeah. have taken. <laughs> that's, a... Uh, that's, a very good, yeah, that's a very tough question. Uh, because I, I could answer you what kind of other science I would have wished to do. <laughs> but uh, but if, I th if I think about it now, I actually never thought about this. But uh, I've been always interested in politics. Uh, and I think if I weren't to like, pursue a scientist career, an academic career, I would have uh, loved to uh, engage in politics, uh, whether it's science policy or something <laughs> else. No, but I guess uh, mainly politics and uh, Yeah, I think for me it would have been politics. Yeah, I have a hard time answering to that. I I thought about it already when I had to register for the university for biology at the beginning. And during that summer, I was really trying to find a plan B because all of my friends were undecided. And what should I do? What is uh, like my dream and so on? I knew very well what was my dream. And I was scared about not having a plan B. So what would I do? So I went through all these big books that the universities give with all the, the faculties all the and the, the courses. courses yeah. And I had a very hard time finding <laughs> one that I liked as much. So I, at the end I didn't. But now thinking back, I didn't know back then, but thinking back now, I think one option would be psychology. 
or something related related to people and mm-hmm. talking to people, understanding uh, and trying to help them with any kind of issues. No, she's good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I am, but I enjoy talking to people a lot. And uh, but I. Th- I think it's a part of a skill I developed over time also during the PhD. I don't know how or why the PhD helped me in that sense, but I really think I improved in that matter. Or I don't know, when I was younger, um, I was in the high school of classical studies and I loved like Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. So I would have probably taken that path. I think it's even harder than science. So (laughs) I don't know if it was a good idea. And now, but it's too much related to science, I would probably be in scientific communication. <laughs> but yeah, still science. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, doing what, like, what next, so what do you guys have planned for whatever is coming up after the PhD? Um, I already have a position in Boston, in, uh, in the US, uh, which I was, as I mentioned earlier, supposed to start by fall. Um, so for me, I, uh, um, I still, uh, or I wish to stay in academia uh, and um, hopefully one day uh, lead my own uh, group uh, where I can pursue my own ideas uh, in terms of uh, currently uh, genetics and genetic diseases. Um, but, but yeah, let's see what, what, what the days will show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there is no person more suited to academia than you. So. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm flushing. <laughs> flushing or blushing? <laughs> blushing. <laughs> flushing is uh, the wrong word for sure. <laughs> it was a mix between blushing, blushing and fluttered. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, I also wish to stay in academia. Uh, I had up, ups and downs during the PhD, but now I don't know if I'm in up phase, but I'm in a academia phase Mm -hmm. right now and I'm trying to understand uh, what is really the topic I would love to pursue my postdoc in. I think that has been one of the most difficult parts of the PhD, trying Mm -hmm. to understand what I like because I would like to change field, although it's tough to find something else that you don't know and uh, you, you are excited about. So I'm trying to understand that. So, so far as academia. Mm-hmm. And as I said, uh, if things, yeah, I don't know, for uh, many different reasons wouldn't go well afterwards, I think I would move more to the like mm, communication part of science. I would, I would actually enjoy it a lot. Mm-hmm. So uh, speaking of uh, communicating science and also doing stuff apart from academia, so have you sort of, during any time during your research or any part of you know, exploring science, have you used some concept or some topic, some wacky idea from outside, from television or from movies or whatever, that you've sort of incorporated into your work or your, your daily lifestyle? Is there something along these lines? What are you referring to by work? Like, I mean, like a project or? It could be. So is it some wacky or very creative idea which you saw somewhere, you got inspired by something and did you incorporate that into your project or your, the way you do research? Or is there is there something along those lines? Is there something which you sort of it's a very creative or wacky idea, out of the out of the box? <laughs> I well, I have to admit that sometimes I I hear these things and uh, they they trigger some um, like kind of thinking into coming up with also crazy ideas or they influence me to think in a also similar manner. Uh, which, uh, but I have to like, but I didn't really put it into a project or put it into my life before. I mean, I have I have like a a document where whenever I come up with like crazy ideas because of good science communicators, I would say, <laughs> or uh, or good research papers or whatever, then I would put it there. But uh, it's still a document. Maybe one day it goes into uh, uh, into action. But uh, right <laughs> now it's just on paper. Uh, um, but but yeah, for, for now, nothing, but I have to admit that I was influenced by a lot of uh, good science communicators in terms of how to present and how to uh, deliver uh, my research and in a simple way. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's mainly like willing to be like them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's a very difficult question. I tried for, yeah, very long and I'm still trying every day to, to try to 
read outside the box, uh-huh. at least. So try to read things that are not related to what we are doing necessarily and try to apply that into my science. Uh-huh. I didn't really find the way to do that yet <laughs> either. So it's still, uh, I, I think it's something very important and something very difficult to do. But I think that once you manage to, to arrive at that level of creativity, that's, well, mm-hmm. it's done then. I mean, so, so would you say that, like, you know, so it's sort of this, you've had this creative impulse by, let's say, doing some repetitive activity, let's say, washing dishes or <laughs> doing laundry or something. And somehow there's this spark from this. Like, I could have thought about my project from this angle. Well, right. yeah, ideas coming in uh, crazy times for sure. Ideas coming in the middle of the night when I woke up in the morning out of nowhere of doing things totally unrelated. Yes, Seems not probably related to what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think washing dishes really inspired me. But uh, yeah, it's there. Are, you need moments of maybe more relaxed when you, I strongly believe that when you're more relaxed and less thinking about what you're doing at the moment, mm-hmm. you can come up with uh, very creative ideas. Mm-hmm. I think creativity requires uh, a lower amount of stress. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's yeah. my personal view because when you're too stressed and too have too much pressure, you become maybe very productive, but mm, it's hard to think outside the box. Yeah. So it requires a, uh, more relaxed time, <laughs> probably not now. I think that in terms of um, communicating science, uh, or in my case, science, or teaching, the thing I, the person I learned the most uh, from uh, was my teacher. So I scuba dive, so mm-hmm. I'm a, mm, a scuba diving instructor, and I had a mentor, I still have it. Mm-hmm. And uh, he really taught me everything I know about speaking in public, about uh, teaching to students. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the, my teaching skills, I took it from him and he's not a scientist whatsoever. He's a lawyer mm-hmm. and uh, he just does uh, scuba diving, but he's particularly good. And for example, there are like few important things when I teach uh, other people that I always keep in mind that I took from him. One is that the, uh, with some due exceptions, <laughs> uh, that if a um, student fails, is your failure first. <laughs> and uh, as, again, with some exceptions, I still think it's true. And I think it's how I want to, to teach because I think it's very important. And the second that I still think is very important is to try to give like criticism, of course, but mm-hmm. never alone. So every student does something good and something bad. And until you acknowledge what good they did, you cannot really criticize. Or so like the criticism the, doesn't get in the it's right... It's like the hand that strokes the yes. face slaps it as well, or I, slaps the face strokes it as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but uh, we so, have a different saying in, um, in Italian, but yeah, that's the case. And I think it's very important because if you just focus on what is bad there, mm-hmm. it's never going to work. Mohamed, what about you? You have someone who inspired you? In um, terms of uh, like communication or, or or anything, like people who inspired you. Yeah, um, g- going back to your point about students and uh, that teachers are uh, um, like if, if a student fa- like is not successful, then it's also a lack of success for the teacher or the mm-hmm. PI in that way you, you can view it. I remember, um, so I have a twin brother um, and, and so I used to love studying and learning when we were uh, in high school, but he, he wasn't this kind. He was the kind who like, just like tries to take the minimal amount of studying and, and so on. And, and obviously like I had uh, better grades than him. Um, Show off. <laughs> no, 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 but, uh, just come to it. So, and then, Sorry. I mean, of course, uh, I hope he doesn't listen to this, but. Uh, <laughs> Another one not to send yeah. it to <laughs> No, but but mainly because he, I mean he was a different person, you know. So I mean we're twins, but he's more inter- he's more active, he's more interested into um, stuff which does not include sitting down and like reading a book uh, with, of stuff which is not interesting to him, especially in high school. So um, at, at so when when he didn't used to get grades, there we used to have a teacher um, who uh, so in Egypt, I mean sort of in high school, um, there. There is a bit of like, 
wouldn't call it corruption, but I would call it like um, improper scientific, uh, like educational system that in schools, you sometimes do not get enough from, uh, from the teachers in school. So you go into private classes outside. Mm-hmm. And then there are these very famous uh, private teachers who like have big holes where they teach 100 students or something mm-hmm. at the same time. And um, at one day, like, uh, so these teachers, because they think, like Julia said, that the success of their students are their success. Whoever is not really getting good grades at the beginning, they would like um, ask them to leave the class and not be part of the group. Okay, which that, is, which that's is, not what I meant. <laughs> no, but this is a failure, right? Like, I mean, they are, they are uh, yeah. bad, you know, because... It's a failure yeah. for the teacher, exactly. definitely. But they, they just care about, like, that they maintain students who get good grades so that eventually people will know, oh, students with the them success are getting rate good of their Yeah, students. you rate them with... Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think this is, a, this is a thing which is very common as well, right? Because... It's also very common at, in, ca- in academia. In academia, in academia sure. right? Because they, every place wants the, the cream, the top of the cake, exactly. the cream of the students. And the thing, problem is you only have so many students. Who, I mean, because everyone has a scope to improve, you just have to get it to them in the way that they can learn it. No, no, exactly. So what I remember is, I mean, it was very strange. He asked my brother to leave the class. And he called my father, my father, asking him that I'm the only one allowed to come from now on, you know? <laughs> and of course, this my, made my dad crazy and also made me very, like, crazy. And I said, okay, like, we're, it's either both of us are going or none no, of us no, are no, going to go. Yeah. But what my dad called him and then told him exactly what Julia said. And then told him that if you're getting a smart or, like, uh, a kid who can, who has the willingness to learn, and then this, uh, I mean, not kid high school, but, like, a uh, teenager who, who's willing to learn, and then they get high, uh, good grades... It's not because you're a good teacher. It's because they're naturally gifted. And uh, if you want to be a good teacher, you have to convert those that who are not naturally gifted into those that can be naturally gifted. And, uh, and this, of course, applies to academia. And I have to admit that after this conversation, this, this teacher changed his mind and he admitted my brother into the class again. And after that, my brother uh, started and he changed the way he deals with him. And my brother started getting very good grades once again. And at the end of the, like the year, out of the 100 students, he made him stand up in the class because he got a very good grade and told him, I have to apologize to you and please tell your dad, you're right, I'm sorry. Oh, so, okay. that's very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice story that I always remember. And, uh, and I also think it applies for, for academia. So um, as you were describing that here, uh, I mean you're getting the cherry on top and sometimes in, in grad schools and trying to get the best students. But the best thing is, of course, um, training uh, or like teaching someone how to. And I think we were lucky to have a, a mentor or an advisor who helped us like this. But also it's, it puts an uh, extra uh, load on us that in the future, if we ever have supervise yeah. students, we have to do the same way. I so, totally agree. I know cases, unfortunately, in academia of like labs in which like many students were asked to leave. Mm-hmm. At the end on the records, it's written that the student left. Yeah. Of course, nobody would say that uh, they were asked to leave, but I know from the inside that they were asked to leave. And, but even if they left by themselves, it's not good on, on UPI that five people in two years, five students left because there is something weird if so many people left. So also... Because, uh, well, you are the one who has to hire them, so to interview them. So either it tells something on your, uh, like, recruiting skills, or second, most likely, it tells that you are not able to, to deal with, the, with people with properly. With specific needs. Because as Mohammed person. said, like, yeah. it's very easy to teach smart students. I had students that were exceptional and outstanding and was very, very easy. easy and of course it's amazing to teach them because yeah. it's very easy to do that but when i was teaching scuba diving i had people i really had a hard time with one was using uh, um, used to go into the shower with a towel inside because she couldn't stand the water in her eyes okay and she completed the first uh, scuba diving license at the end, uh, well, it was tough, of course, more than uh, when I had another like professional swimmer because it's yes. much easier with someone who, somebody who barely can swim. But at the end, the satisfaction of all of them reaching a similar level, well, uh, I think uh, that tells a lot. Okay, so last question for, for, for now. For today. For today, <laughs> let's say. Uh, is there any piece of advice that you would like to 
give to people who are starting or different phases of their PhD? Because you guys, both of you are almost about to finish your PhDs now. You've sort of been through the whole uh, experience of the first few years, first two or three years, four years now, right? So yeah. is there any advice that you would like to give to the people in earlier stages of their doctoral research? Yeah, I mean, I think what you can infer from the discussion we had is um, get ready for frustrations and know how to deal with it. Um, have another activity in your life that gets you busy, whether it's sports, whether it's cooking, whether it's, you know, any kind of hobby that uh, you're very interested in and don't make the PhD the center of your attention. And, um, and, and of course, yeah, um, I mean, as Julia said, it's tough to not compare yourself to others, but, um, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is something which is very important. Um, and, and yeah, um, just, just do your best in, in, in terms of like designing experiments and, um, and doing your work, uh, and always appreciate the factor of, of luck, I would say. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Just to add something different, that of course uh, all these points were are probably the most important. Recently, so at least I have the the chance to say it. I didn't tell anyone recently, but I read a, an article. I don't remember exactly. I yeah, in some journals, some scientific journals, uh, praising the importance of vulnerability, mm-hmm. and in science, I I was really enlightened by that. And so many times I ask like uh, PIs and uh, senior people, how you get through frustration and rejections and so on. And many of them told me, uh, you have to develop a thick skin. Mm. I realized with time that I just partially agree with that. Mm -hmm. And, but this is because I am like this, but what I strongly believe is that you don't necessarily have to develop a thick skin, Mm -hmm. or at least you don't need that. Uh, to suppress your emotion for that so you don't need to become uh, like insensitive to like frustration or to bad mood or anything like this it's it's okay as Mm -hmm. now it's very common to say it's okay not to be okay (laughs) and uh, it's okay to have moments where you really feel down and you have to acknowledge that and I think uh, just take the time to to feel sad if you had a rejection, if you had a, a failure or so on, and just learn from that and, and move on. But mm-hmm. yeah, just I mean, don't... It's just that you don't have to suppress you don't your have feelings, to. but you can experience yeah, you don't them, need... but try to learn from... You don't need to, I don't think you need to build like a shield mm-hmm. uh, between you and the failure, you and the um, rejection and so on. You just need to take your time. <laughs> it's it's gonna different be okay. for everyone. Yeah, it's, you yeah. can find your own rhythm. Definitely, yes, but just know that it's fine to to feel bad and uh, it's not the end of the world and yeah, we'll get better with all the moments we mentioned before that are going to delete all the bad days yeah. <laughs> before. Exactly. Yeah, also, actually, yeah. something which I would like to add about peer pressure, uh, something which I found very useful is positive jealousy, not, not, not the ones which bring you down, but the ones that inspire you. So I, I think I didn't answer your question about who inspired me with science communication, but I remember this meeting that we had in, um, in, it was in Frankfurt, I think, three years ago. Maybe you were not even yet there. Uh, you know this guy who I uh, talked to you about, uh, my Egyptian friend in Heidelberg? Yes. So um, he, he wasn't a friend back then. I just got to know him. So, Ali. Yeah, Ali Sleet, his name yeah. is. And, and he, gave, like, he gave a talk in that lecture, which was unbelievable. The, the way he presented was amazing. And... From his presentation, this was so inspiring to me that I was like, I want to be like him, you know, I want to be able to deliver science the way that he does. I mean, I'm not I'm no close to him yet, but he was a very so, big source of inspiration rather than a peer pressure in terms of thinking of it, oh, I cannot present good as him and bringing myself down. But he was like, no, I want to be like him. So uh, I think, yeah, just to finally add, uh, positive jealousy is good, but not making it uh, a pressure on yourself. <laughs> okay. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, I think with that, we've come to the end of this say, recording session. Uh, I really would like to thank you guys for taking time out and, you know, thank you. I recording think we, this. We both enjoyed. Yeah, thank you so it much. Was, uh, it was really fun. It was a I, 
yeah, well, it's a new experience, and uh, let's see how this turns out. Let's see how people uh, feel about our good. opinions on things. Also, it's good for whoever speaks because you never really get the chance to to say to reason and to say these things mm-hmm. to others. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pichi, that as well. Huge thanks to the first two guests of the Offspring podcast. And if you, the listener, would like to be featured in one of our episodes or would like to get in touch with us about any feedback, comments, or any suggestions with that regard, please write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de. You can follow us on any platform of your liking. We are currently available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Radio Public, Pocket Casts, and any such podcasting platform. And if we're not available on a platform of your liking, please write us an email about it and we'll make sure we are available on that platform as soon as possible. Thanks a lot for listening and thanks for being an amazing audience. And I will see you guys next week along with my co-host Nico where we get to interview one of the pioneers of the open access movement.